Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. Thanks, family, from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I want to first wish you all a happy new year. And so this is the first episode uh, of 2022, and uh, we got two, two new lovely co-hosts, um, Kiana Holliman and Dora Trillo. How y'all doing, ladies? Hi. So, Dora, this is your first chief chat. Um, so you got people watching. You got friends and family out there supporting you. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited to be on with you and Kiana on chief chat and happy to be interviewing our very cool guest today. But, yeah, I shared the link with all my friends and family and I they better be watching. No, I'm, I think I can watch <laughs> for sure. You better be watching. How about yeah. you, Kiana? <laughs> no, I shared the link with everyone I knew as well. We're all super excited about today's guest for sure. Well, okay. Well, let's let's jump into the guest then. Uh, so, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Okay. So today we have an award-winning actor, producer, and Marine Corps veteran with us today. You know him from The Forty-Year-Old Virgin, Think Like a Man, Night School, and his current role as Rom on A Million Little Things. Please give a warm chief chat welcome to Romani Malco. Hey. hey. Received. Received. Happy 2022 to everyone and congratulations on becoming new co-hosts on thank Chief Chat. You. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you. Thank awesome. You. Awesome, man. So Romani, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you know, you of course, you know, we all know you from the from the big screen, but I did not know that you were a Marine Corps veteran. So we'll talk about that a little bit later in the interview. But uh can you let our viewers know where you're coming to us from today? Yeah, uh what's up? My yeah. name is Romani Malco and uh uh I am currently living in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is uh, uh, just north of uh, Seattle as you cross into the Canadian border. And I've been here because I've been working on this project called A Million Little Things uh, for ABC for the last three going on four years. Very cool. Well, I'm glad you're here. And I know it's only been a couple of weeks, but how's the new year treating you? Um, did you make any yeah. new, new year resolutions? Okay. I normally make new year resolutions. And, um, you know, this year I didn't because I had already set a lot of things in motion. And so I would just say having an 11 month old baby is oh, yeah. pulling all the focus and all of the excitement. But, um, yeah, man, I think I, 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 I kicked off. I feel like the year kicked off with some love. I will say that. That's, awesome. That's exciting. It's always good to hear. Love is all you need, right? It's the answer for everything. It, yo, it sounds corny, you know, but like, you know, I grew up in a house where it was where folks didn't really apologize. They just made a bigger scene to distract from the area that they were vulnerable <laughs> in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah, like, exactly. um, I, I, even at my age, I'm still unlearning all of these counterproductive mm -hmm. habits and just, you know, you, you can't, you know, just learning so many different things about what actual love is. And I don't know if you know, but I'm a stepdad of two, right? And then I just had my first biological child. And I've been a stepdad for going for seven years. And here comes this little newborn and I look at this newborn and I'm looking at him downloading me and realizing how emotionally unavailable I've been to the world throughout my life. Not, not knowing this my entire life, but it really clicked with him because of how much, how emotionally present he required me to be. Mm -hmm. And it really helped me understand like most of us are going through life emotionally unavailable because we're flinching, scared of being hurt but we want all the benefits of a secure and vulnerable relationship. You know what I'm saying? That's man, most man, of this, man, this sounds like a therapy session. Cause I was just yeah. thinking about that too. Uh, Cause uh, <laughs> so I, I thought about my life growing up too. And um, like how we, I lived in survival mode like forever. Right. So I grew up learning how to survive and, and survive living in survival mode doesn't lend well to, to love and, and, and all these other things when it comes to being emotional, you just, you're trying to protect yourself from getting hurt from 
everything that you 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 kind of deal with on a daily basis so man you hitting stuff that i was literally just thinking about this morning so i was like man you survival mode is good for uh certain elements of your life but for the most part uh it's you don't have to live in survival mode your your whole entire life no it's true you know um well first of all you're a considerably you're a considerably young man so congratulations on even having those thoughts that early in life you know but for the most part in at least in my experience a, a lot of survival mode is combative and yeah whether you're dealing with intimacy or business a combative stance uh only begets more combat right and the real goal is to at least I've been I read this book. It was uh, I just finished it, too. It's called And Baby Makes Three by John Gottman and his wife, actually. Uh, uh, and they were talking about how when you, uh, you know, they were talking about how when you're having differences with someone, the goal should be to not only understand what they're saying, but be able to repeat it back to them so that they know that they've been heard. And. I was like, oh, <laughs> because <laughs> how we grew up, how we grew up was if someone coming to you with something that you disagree with in the combative world, you got to shut that shit down before, yeah. it, before it propagates. And the next thing you know, you know what I'm saying? You the laughing stock of the hood. And so, um, yeah, like really trying to understand and exercise these things is, is really what's making the difference. And so a hundred, you, you are, you're a hundred percent right. Um, you're a hundred percent right that uh it does it doesn't serve actually in any world not not just intimacy but in business as well absolutely absolutely for sure and we'll talk more about emotional availability and mental health a bit more when we dive into who rome is and his role on a million little things but first things first let's talk about your military background so you right. served in the united states marine corps from 1987 to 1991 Facts. And since you've had a chance to take a USO tour in 2013, and you always continue to voice your support of the military community as well. So I guess what inspired you to join the Marines and what are some of your strongest memories of your time in uniform? My only aspirations uh, as a child was to be a rapper. Now we talking, this is a dude graduating from high school in 1987. Uh, that just wasn't a good plan. It just was not a good plan. And, um, uh, you know, the military recruiters came around and my and, and my father being of, of Caribbean descent, he was like, hey, you go to you go to military. You your college is paid for. Yeah, you could utilize that to pay for your school. You know, we didn't have money like that. And um, that made sense to me. And it just gave me the sense of security. And to be honest with you, initially, I was just kind of going through the motions. But here's the funny thing. My friend Kenrick, who was in ROTC, when we went to high school, he joined ROTC. He got me to join ROTC. And in ROTC, I really liked how we had to like, we had to press our, you know, we had to press our blues and we had to, you know, we had to starch up and come clean and like, I kind of, was like, oh shoot, this is a structure that I never had in my life. I grew up with absolutely no structure. And so over time I began to like draw, grow attracted to the concept of having more structure in my life and seeing the military as a vehicle for that. Guess what? I joined the Marine Corps, he ain't joined no military. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's funny you say that. So I, I do have a question because um, for those that know me, uh, I, I'm a I'm a proud airman right now, but I started my actual uh, military career in the Marine Corps, and so uh, so I, my question is: are, are you a Hollywood Marine, or did you did you go to Paris Island? Yeah, I'm a Hollywood Marine. I ain't going front. That's what I'm, I'm talking a Hollywood about. Marine. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Hey, hey, Camp Pendleton, baby. I'd be squad guy. Listen, by the time the funny thing about about uh, going through boot camp, which was probably my favorite thing of all time. Um, the funny thing about going through boot camp is that uh, you had to learn to disconnect. You had to learn to like disconnect and just execute. And um, that exact tool. So, and, and let me give you an example. For no, you, you, literally, our drill sergeant would go stand in front of a puddle, and he'd be like, "Private Malgo," and I just come up, sir, yes, sir. Reporting is ordered, sir. Right? Boom. 
stand in front of him, but I'm standing in the puddle because I have to stand in front of him. And he'd be like, drop. And I'd have to drop in that puddle. And he'd be like, roll left. And I'd have to roll left in that puddle. He'd be like, roll right. I'd have to roll right in that puddle. Not question it, not ask the logic behind it. Just execute. And then continue the hike wet. Right? That's how we got down. That, um, I don't care if you was on Paris Island or not. <laughs> that type of stuff will mess with your mind. You know what I'm oh, saying? No, absolutely. That will mess absolutely. with your mind. And, and I and, and it's funny because I I find myself at times doing that now. I mean, my brother have a saying, put your head down and do the work. And there are times when I can just block out all emotion, all logic, and just get the work done. So sometimes yeah. it works to my advantage. Oh no, absolutely. And 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 it, and it kind of brings me back to a, a fond memory because I went to uh San Diego and Camp Pendleton for my, my boot camp as well. And I can remember right. uh, I can remember them saying, eat duck, right? So when you go in in the child hall. Everybody's got to have their head down and focus on eating because when the first person that lifts their heads up, then everybody's done. And so mm -hmm. it's like, OK, got to go. So no, it's like, no, let me let me focus out on what I want to talk because, you know, normally at the dinner. So I went home for Thanksgiving, uh, probably year two that I was in. And everybody's like fellowshipping and talking. And I got my head down eating this turkey. <laughs> I'm going in. Right. I'm going in. I'm not having a conversation. Like I'm solely focused on the task at hand. And so back then it just looked weird to everybody else. But then now that I've kind of stepped back and I'm older and I'm able to kind of uh, understand, like, no, you need to stop and focus on what you got, what you got to do. And then then. Execute. Yeah, man. A hundred percent. Even today, you know, social media, man, it pulls so much of us like I, I've my, my my lady and I have actually deleted Instagram from our phones. Like yeah. I, I I, I stopped doing Facebook, I don't know, a hundred years ago, but I stopped doing, and it's because of that. Like you, you know, there is, m people tout, oh, you got to multitask, but I really think like this mono focus kind of vibe is really what gets things done, at least in my life, man. And, um, and, 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 and so those are, those are things that I do appreciate about the military because I grew up with absolutely no structure. So I was like you too, you know, where I would walk so fast, people would be like, yo, what are you doing? You know, but right, I had a mission. I was always, contrary to what happened today, I was always 15 minutes early to all appointments. Those were blessings. Those were good habits to obtain, you know, especially coming from a Caribbean family. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as Kiana mentioned, you're still a major major supporter of the military community. So you even took a USO tour to Afghanistan. So can you kind of uh, tell us what that experience was like? Oh, dude, um, you know, flying over there, we, we flew into uh, uh, Turkey and then eventually landed in Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan kind of sits on the border before you cross into um, Kyrgyzstan. It's interesting because, you know, after Kyrgyzstan comes Afghanistan and Pakistan. And like, it's weird because it's the only base I think in the world where the Russians and the US share the territory. And um, I got there and just didn't expect people to be as young as they were, man. Mm -hmm. I was expecting more mature, older men to be out there sacrificing their lives. And it just reminded me, that's right. I was in the military when I was fresh out of high school. Yeah. And so when you land in Kyrgyzstan, you're on the Air Force base and you don't realize how dirty it really is until you cross into Afghanistan and you get to Bagram. And when you get into Afghanistan and all of a sudden they have these T cells that are surrounding the buildings that you're in. And um, I couldn't sleep in those buildings because the AC was just ridiculous. It was too sterile. There were no windows that don't work for a brother like me. So I asked to stay in a bee hut. If you don't know what a bee hut is, it's just basically uh, some plywood put up to set up a, you know, uh, a little house so that you can, you know, be, be in. And, um, uh, when I was in the bee hut, uh, we got like a big, we got hit. They tried to bomb us. And, um, it, the, the thing is, is you learn that, uh, a lot of the people over there don't have an allegiance to anybody. So you can, you can literally hire mercenaries, uh, to bomb our military or to bomb Russian military or 
to bomb Israel or to bomb Pakistan. They ain't loyal to nobody. And so we had gotten hit, and it's just it's hilarious, too. I, we, we, I heard a horn come on. We were told to put on our, put on our gear. If it escalated, we were all going to have to run out into these big uh, conga. This is at night. I'm sleeping. These huge concrete uh, cylinders that we would hide yep. in that would kind of protect us from shrapnel. Um, well, I put on the gear, but I don't know what happened after that. And so all of a sudden, I hear boom, 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 and I wake up out of my dream. And these dudes are coming to check on me. They're like, Malco, Malco, we got hit. Are you all right? Are you all right? Yo, I had put on the helmet, put on the, the, the vest and everything, and went right back yeah. to sleep. They <laughs> 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 knocked, Yo, knocked man, they out. Took huh? pictures. Yo, I was like this on my bunk, like what? They took pictures, video. That it, I don't know. If, I don't know if they posted on the internet, but it's embarrassing. Anyway, um, but no, uh, that was good. That was a good kickoff for me because it was very sobering and helped me understand right away how serious it was. And um, from that point forward, we then flew on Black Hawks to different bases throughout. And uh, yeah, man, it was just a lot of kids who maybe had one girlfriend, had went on one date their entire life, you know, had all this life ahead of them. And, um, you know, they were out there risking their lives and manning these killing machines. And, uh, and it was crazy because, the, you know, the people that I met in Afghanistan were such good people. They wanted to cook for you. You know, they were so hospitable. They didn't even, some, some people didn't even have much, but they were so generous. All my movies were there. On bootleg, all of them, right? <laughs> yeah. you they, probably like, they probably misspelled. They probably a little bit, but they yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was written out in a different language, but all my movies. I was like, oh, I'm so flattered. I bought a Rolex. I bought a Rolex for like three dollars. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah, man. And anyway, uh, it was heartbreaking, dude. And when I, I, I'm sorry if I'm jumping ahead. You may have questions, but I just when I left, I cried every once a week for like a year. And then mm -hmm. I ran into Dennis Hays Haysworth, um, uh, you know, the voice of all state insurance. And he said he'd been over there like nine, 10 times because of the unit, yeah. the show that he was on. And he was like, listen, you're suffering from PTSD, bro. Oh. And uh, he was like, it has that impact and you need to talk to someone. And he was right. You know, it was just, I never forget, I cried the day I was leaving because I felt like I should be switching places with these kids, you know? I'd lived, my, I'd lived a full life by that point. And I was like, this kid's half my age, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, I, I had the unique, I oh, know, go ahead, Dora. No. Oh no, I was just going to thank him for sharing. Thank you, Romani, for sharing about that. That's really amazing stories. And I love um, that you guys, you and Chief are, are, are sharing military experiences. <laughs> um, so we were just going to kind of talk about your range as an actor and, you know, how, kind of how you went, from that, but I don't know if Chief has another question. Yeah, no, I was just gonna uh, add on to the the, the unique, uh, you know, opportunity that I have here uh, of, of doing the show. I got a chance to talk to some very interesting people, and we had uh, Medal of Honor recipients on about a year ago around uh, Veterans Day, and all of the ones that I talked to, the, the oldest was 23, right? And so they did these heroic acts uh, of you know sacrificing their life to save other people's lives uh, all below the age of 23. Just the, I think we had maybe four, four on. And even me being in the military and, and me being in that atmosphere when I was 25, 26, uh, it, me now as a, and it, you call me young. So, I, you know, Dora, Dora and Kiana, you heard it here first. I'm, I'm a young man, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah but, but even me now, it, 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 it baffles me that we we're like, the, the folks that are out there risking their lives that are doing these amazing things are, are literally, uh, cause I got a 22 year, old, 22 year old son and I'm thinking like, man, my 22 year old son, you know, at times I don't think he can, you know, fight his way out of a paper bag, but just to think that he can go over there with the right training and defend this country is just amazing to me. So uh, thank you for sharing that. It, no, definitely. And thank you. And by, by the way, thank you for your service. Listen, in fact, wait, should I be thanking all of you for your service? Military well, branches, ladies. Those who serve, so we're it's cheap. Ah, and thank you for your service too. And you know, I'm not. You know, it's true, man. Um, something that really stood out to me was particularly uh, when the Marines 
when those young men came over, I, I you know, I would hang out at this bar called uh, PD's um, on, on the Air Force Base and get to talk to all the Marines army kids and by the way they were they were there were volunteers there from 30 different countries whether they were doing whether they were contractors uh mm -hmm. material uh, uh inventory specialists whatever uh people from all over the world there and um i really noticed man when the when the marine when those young men came back they were the the most damaged because they'd be in the field hiding in caves insurgents at the top of the mountain and at the bottom and the only way they could get their food was for the helicopters to bring it in and just basically drop a pallet so in other words you had to risk your life to run grab and pull that pallet back and every time you ran out to get your food you got shot at and it just made me wonder like how are these kids going to heal from that seeing they're losing their friends just basically looking for basic necessities food and they felt extremely neglected. They felt, uh, uh, they just felt like things were quite a bit unfair. They felt like they could have had more help. And you know, it's such a, because of the terrain, it's such a compromised situation. It's extremely difficult to, to maneuver and navigate. And um, you know, I, I, I looked at these guys and you could tell that they were dealing with things that were gonna be staying with them for the rest of their life, you know? And if there was one thing I wish the military would do, I wish the military would basically guarantee uh, you know, a lifetime's worth of, 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 of therapy uh, to those who, uh, who serve in combat. Absolutely. And, and, you know, just, you know, before we move on to our next question, just, uh, this is a, just another opportunity uh, to, to highlight, listen, if, if, if you need help, please go seek help. So um, we always preach that to our, 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 our military members, uh, my airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, uh, if you need help, please, please go get it. So thank you. Thank you for uh, reminding us about that, Maramani. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, it's in, um, we'll just kind of go on to the next question. But we, just basically because your fans, you know, you're not really on social media these days, but they have been commenting on your, like, amazing range as an actor. So how did you get started in acting? Oh, that's that's a great question. Alondra? Yeah. Did I get your name right? Dora, I'm Dora. Dora. Dora, who the hell? Yeah. Well, I don't know where I got that name from. Okay, look. It's okay. Let's just start. I'm the newbie. I'm That's the a newbie great newbie. question, okay. Dora. It's all right. That was Dora. How, how he you... combined Dora and Kiana together. That's what he happened. Yeah, Kiana yeah. and Dora. Right. Oh, I got... oh, nice. Nice connection there. I can't I, believe I, you have I a 22 got... year old, by the way. Who, me? Yeah, I can't believe you have a 22 year old son. Oh, I got I got a grandson. He he's got a son. So it's <laughs> yeah, it's tell me about it. <laughs> Yo, what 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 hair dye are you using, bro? Cuz mine is <laughs> It's cocoa butter. Cocoa um, butter and no and no stress. No stress, man. People don't understand. Um well, look, I'm flattered that people are really like uh, sp uh speaking about my range on the internet. Um I love it when they come to me and they're like, "Dude, I can't believe you're the same dude from this movie or this movie. Uh, makes me feel great. But yeah, um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, just how you got started. How you got started in acting, you know, because we we spent a little time on, on your military experiences. But how um, how you kind of made that move over to acting? It's a miracle. When I was a rapper, literally, when I was a rapper, I started. I I, I signed a record deal in 1989. I had a hit record called Victim of the Ghetto in 1990. It kind of became the anthem that went right along with the riots because every news program would play mm -hmm. our song, Victim of the Ghetto, when they covered the, when they reported the riots. That made our song famous as all hell. And um, uh, I was filming like my second or third music video and there just happened to be someone who was a casting agent on set and they were like, you could be an actor. You know that, right? No, you could really be an actor. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Didn't really play any mind. And I sure enough uh, got a call from a guy named Ruben Cannon. And Ruben Cannon was like, yo, he's, you know, he's a big time casting agent. And he was like, listen, man, we're doing this movie called Trespass. And we would really love to have you come in. I've been hearing good things about you. My wife says that you're very talented. I was like, I'm not an actor. He's like, I know, I know, I know. But we need someone kind of raw for this. So come on in. 
And I went in and I gave the, the I, I, I auditioned for it with his guidance. And then he was like, oh, you got to meet the director. And he brought me back in to meet Walter D. Hill. And, um, you know, my lack of experience, I wasn't as consistent in my in my audition or performance as I was the first time. But he this Ruben Cannon guy was like such a fan. And so uh, Walter Hill said, hey, if you had to choose between going on tour or doing this movie, what would you choose? I was like going on tour. What do you think? Bro, I've been waiting for this my whole life. And so anyway, they gave the role to Ice Cube. I don't think they were going to give it to me anyway. You know, and uh, Ice Cube did the role in Trespass and I went on tour. Yeah. Um, and uh, many years later, uh, the acting opportunity resurfaced, right? And how is because a guy named John Leguizamo had heard some music that I had um. written for Paula Abdul's animated Cat, and Leguizamo was like, yo, dude, I want to rap Cat. We got connected. We started hanging out. That dude is a good man. His wife at the time was like, yo, John. You hang out with comedians all the time, Romney, funny, and all of them. Why don't you ask him to be in your movie? So I ended up auditioning for John's movie. John couldn't be there because he was in Mexico filming uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet at the time. But the casting agent and the director, the casting agent's name was Wendy Kurtzman. And she had me come in with the director about six times. And then they had me do what's called a mix match session. And honestly, I just dropped the ball. I didn't I didn't have the experience to just kind of do stuff on the fly. I had to really study it to, and bring a performance to you. And so um, I ended up not getting the role, but she went and told everybody in Hollywood that I was her favorite audition of all time. So that was the end of that. And uh, like a year later, my phone starts blowing up and it was all, it was pilot season. I didn't even know what pilot season was. Yeah. And all these people are calling and asking for Romney and sending, wanting to fax, my fax number to fax over things. And, and my girl's cool with it. And she calls me and tells me about all these people calling. I'm like, well, what you answering the phone for? I don't know these people. Are they white? Do they sound like police officers? Like straight up paranoid, didn't know what the heck the deal was. And uh, it ended up being just a bunch of people who were casting uh, TV shows. And so I ended up calling one agent back because she was the only person that was like don't call anyone and blah 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 she was the only one that was like yo uh sounds like things are happening pretty fast for you i'm not sure if you're even interested in acting but if you are my name's lisa desante and i would love it if you give me a call and we could discuss the possibilities yo i went to her office with a checkbook in my pocket look dora looking at me like i'm lying no <laughs> i had a checkbook in my pocket because i thought i had to pay her to get put on <laughs> Yeah, and, no, um, I, I like the impression you did of her very soft, soft voice, calming. Yeah, that's the one you she, called back. <laughs> right, exactly. But and the funny thing is that she would yell at me all the time. But yeah, she was very soft spoken <laughs> on the phone and very considerate of where I might be, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that was how I got into acting. <clears throat> that's that exciting. So we spoke a bit about your the seriousness of being in the Marines and just the structure, whereas in acting, there's a lot of you know, opportunity to be flexible and be creative. So what was that transition like, I guess, from a culture and emotional standpoint? Well, I, I, I think that that's, I, I think that, you know, uh, the film industry is a lot more like the military than people want to know, right? Mm -hmm. we, we like to think of it as glamorous because once the project is complete and we're spending marketing dollars, the marketing aspect of it can be very, very glamorous because you're making all of these, um, I just heard myself. Um, that was you, you're me, so making, sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. You know, you're making all these partnerships for marketing. And so, you know, Maserati is like, here, you can use our car. And, you know, in exchange, we just want the plug. And, you know, you, you know, all these different, uh, you know, these fashion aficionados are like, yo, I want you to wear my gear and you wear this jewelry. And so it looks very glamorous. But the truth of the matter is, is that quite often I go to work at 4.42 a.m. And the reason it, it's 4.42 is because rather than operate in, in 10 minute increments, we operate in six minute increments because it's easier to fill the hour when you're putting out call sheets and that type of thing. Um, the other thing is, is that, um, yo, sometimes when we're on a set and they're serving you food, it's like, you know, it's, it's basically prison slop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, it ain't it ain't what you think. It's prison slop. Like, I've definitely had better food in the military. I'll say that, yeah. right? 
Um, the, uh, the, the, the other part of it is, is that there is no room for tardiness. You don't get to be tardy in our industry because uh, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars per hour to show up. I mean, you know, to film. So when you're late, you're costing thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, that seemed like a seamless transition, if you ask me. Uh, but the other part of it is that uh, where you do get to thrive is, is that I have found whether you're writing film or you're acting in film, your performances or your product will reflect the depth in which you understand life. So empathy and your ability to understand human behavior really helps you uh, as a performer if you're able to connect the two. Some people can't help it. They're in front of a camera and they have to perform and they just kind of roboticize it. Oh my God, I can't believe you did that to her. That's so unfair. Oh really, that's so exciting. <laughs> you know, you get that, right? But some people are actually able to relax in front of the camera and draw from their catalog of life. And I like to think of myself as the person who's done that. And it has definitely, uh, it has definitely benefited me. And I think the biggest thing is coming up in the family that I came up in is people made fun of themselves all the time. So we made, and we made light of so much trauma that I could like depict things such as like what I do with Tijuana Jackson that were tragic and make you laugh at the same time. Well, no, you you transitioned quite well in, into my next question because you you're a funny dude, and just like uh, John Leguizamo's uh, old lady was like, "Hey, he funny." Like we we caught that in the first five minutes of talking to you. So, uh, we, you bring That's us right. a, a bunch of a laughs in in, a, in your movies, the forty year old virgin and think like a man, and uh, your character Rome on a million little things is funny, but he's got a little deeper side to him. And so you yeah. you're showing your range as an actor. So what what is it like playing Rome? Oh uh, man, you know, look, uh, it's it's probably the I I don't think I've ever taken a role as seriously as I take Rome, and it's because I feel like I'm representing a group of people in the world uh, who need to not only be taken seriously but uh, destigmatized. Is that the right term? Like. You know, there's this way you interpret a person who, you know, there's a statistic where if, you know, if, if, if a woman opens up about being depressed, you know, 75% of her peers actually seek to nurture her. If a man opens up about being depressed, about 75 of his peers seek to ostracize him. And so, uh, you know, I think a lot of men, especially when you're not in tune with your emotions, you struggle to, uh, 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 to, to, you know, to witness, you struggle to witness mortality, you struggle to witness vulnerability. And I think that that may play a big role in it. And so I just want to make sure that as this role, I'm always doing my best. I read so many books on depression, talk to therapists, talk to doctors. And then being a, a black man dealing with depression was very interesting because as a doctor from UCLA explained, he was like, happiness defined by say, perhaps a black family um, is going to be very different than happy in America very different from the typical black white family in the United States of America. And you know what? It goes beyond that. It can be just individual to individual as well. So, you know, a black individual who has experienced the military and maybe went to combat may have a different uh, uh, a depiction of happiness than, say, a, a, a young black man who instead went to an HBCU, so forth and so on. And, um, and anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, I, 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 I take playing Rome extreme very seriously. I, I really try to do my homework and, um, you know, try to be responsible with the role. You know, it's hard to play a dude trying to kill himself. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And you don't want to you don't want to make a mockery of it because then you're gonna piss off a lot of people, and yeah. you know. And then you don't want to feel responsible for anyone harming themselves. And so far, let me knock on wood. All I've gotten is people coming to me and being like, "Yo, bro." A dude had my ta had a tattoo of of Rome of me on his calf. Oh wow! Calf. Oh wow! And he was like, "You live my life. You dip no." He said, "You play my life. That's my life." And um and and it's so funny. I was actually officiating a wedding for for his 
fan, you know, I don't want to say because not you're gonna know who he is, but I was officiating a wedding for a family member, and he told me that, and oh, he broke my heart. Yeah, no, that's that that's that's awesome, and like I say, um, we we appreciate you for for really, you know, being being a you know taking your craft as serious you, as you do because you know it's you know when you gotta kind of take in this this role of uh, of that magnitude, man, it's that that can be tough. You know, in itself, because like you said, you, you know, that's a that's a that's a big ball to carry, you know, especially when we talk about suicides and stuff, because uh, that's a very prominent uh, problem in, in in America, in the world, and specifically in the military. And we military. we as leaders are trying to 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 tackle that problem. And we, you know, for me, if there's one thing in the military that I would love to like snap my finger and fix, it would be suicides because it's something that you know. We, we, we beat our head against the wall to try to prevent or try to talk to folks or try to connect or, or create these touch points uh, with, with our airmen or our soldiers or, or people in general, right? Because it, it's a human condition. It, it's a human connection that, 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 um, that, that sometimes will be able to save a person's life. And so uh, we in the military really, really, uh, as leaders, we, 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 we try to think of all kinds of different ways to, to bring it back home and to to make people feel like they're valued and that 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 they're supposed to be here and uh, we, we, so yeah it's it's a problem and, and I'm glad you're kind of touching on that subject as well. No, and thank you, thank you for saying that. It's good to know that there are people out there that are actually looking out for these young men, young women once they come out of the military. You know, I I, I got family in the military and so um, I'm. Uh, I like checking in. I like knowing what's up. Um, and then we have our and then you got to remember a lot of us that are in the military are coming from households uh, that are already dysfunctional. So, you know, you, it, you, you're just compounding, you know, yeah. uh, the, the drama. But yeah, you know, and then but I'll have that. And then on the flip side, I have somebody run up to me and tell me, don't put the putty on a pedestal. And, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> start quoting putty over, you know. <laughs> Like, I'm like, this is my mother. This is my mother looks young. I'm like, this is my mom. <laughs> Man, <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. So, but wow. it, it's just beautiful to have played such a range and like these projects be so uh, significant because, you know, I have, <clears throat> I have an 18 year old daughter, you know, and like mm -hmm. sometimes her friends, I can hear them in the basement quoting old movies of mine. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah let me not go down there and let them know I'm, I'm eavesdropping but they just quoting you know like she's like i can't stand that people are always quoting you in school i love it i love it i think it's dope <laughs> that it's transcended like generation after generation you know yeah that's very neat and it's really neat that um the um writers for a million little things um write about the topics that you know that you're portraying on the show and it, you know, it's back on ABC on Wednesdays at 10, 9 central. Of course, I think yep. it streams on Hulu as well. So is there right. anything that you can share about season four that's coming up for Rome? You know, last I heard, you know, because, I, you know, um, uh, we, we get a little check-ins, but we don't get the whole thing. But I think someone's going to die. <gasps> someone's oh. dying. And I'm mm -hmm. like, dying as in die, dying as in killed, dying as in what? <laughs> he goes, there's a death. So I don't know if that's a suicide or I don't know if that's a, a homicide. I just know oh. there's going to be a death, you know? Okay. And so uh, that that's that's a big one. Um, also, uh, I, I I get the vibe that um, um, at least because we don't get we don't get to know too much. But I um, I get the vibe that Rome and Regina are uh, about to cross uh, into an, an, uh, a new place in their relationship. And if you don't know, Rome and Regina, so I play this guy, my name is Rome, I, I, my character is Rome. It, it's named after me because the character was written for me. I actually, now I'm gonna go off topic because I just got no. that ADHD like a real dude. Um, <laughs> I honestly don't like doing network television. So for two years, I told the writer that I would not do the show unless it were not on network television. But once I read it, I felt like I didn't want to just hand this role over to anyone. I didn't want yeah. any. I was like, there's a responsibility that comes with this. And oh, my God, it would break my heart to see this role being played incorrectly. 
In no way am I implying that I'm some great, amazing thespian. But there is a level of vulnerability and honesty that is required to depict a character such as Rome. And I ain't gonna lie, I became possessive of it. I had been hearing about it for two years. And when I really started to look at it, and I, I remember the first book I read was, I Don't Want to Talk About It, uh, by, Ter by Dr. Terrence Real. And he's a therapist from way back in the day. And um, wow, it, 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 all these different uh, case studies of, of, of men that he had treated in therapy who were dealing with depression and what it had cost them and how it, you know, their, their families and, and how it, they, it led to them being suicidal. And I was like, wow. oh man, I can't let this role go. I cannot let this role go. And so here I am, you know, doing exactly what I don't want to be doing, which is basically, you know, I basically have a corporate job. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, but at the same time, I want to be depicting Rome. I want to be playing that role. And so uh, to, to, <clears throat> to answer your question, if I even remember what it was, um, is that, uh, well, oh, I'm sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, you shared a little bit about what's coming on season four and that we're just kind of, yeah. or the rest of season four. Um, that's interesting right. about a, a death upcoming. I, exactly, yeah, there'll be death. And, and you know, that's what, yeah, to answer your question, if I remember, and that, which was that, um, I, friggin <clears throat> don't want to know what's happening because I'll do the same thing and I'll just go home and think about it <laughs> and before you know it I'm feeling depressed I'm okay. feeling down because I'm embodying and you know that's how I do my characters I don't know how other people do it but like I remember when they called me to do think like a man are y'all still there Yes, we're yeah, still here. Yeah, yeah, we're still here. Yo, man. Can you hear me? My apologies. Yeah, sorry about that. A little phone call <laughs> came in unexpectedly. Uh, I remember when I was when when they called me in to do think like a man. I was like, "Who y'all want me to play?" They were like, "We want you to be the player." And I was like, "Did Michael Ely pull out of this project?" I was like, "No, no, no, he's still in it." I was like, "Well." Well, what role is he playing then? The super player, right? And they're like, no, he's got a different role, Romney. Trust me. I was like, no, I'm telling y'all, if you want me to be the player, you're making a mistake. I really think they're like, no, no, no. We know you're the player. And uh, what I ended up doing was I ended up walking around for two weeks, basically being an asshole. Hitting on women in ways that I normally wouldn't. Making myself think about my approach. Like normally I meet a woman it's just a natural thing but now i was like calculating approaches i ended up dating a really really nice lady because of that which is horrible to say but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> did uh, you have the one liner the were, were you was you going in with the one liners and the tennis, i wasn't the doing the one liner <laughs> No, you no, know, no. Nah, nah, you know, no. Nah. It's crazy, man. I really, and so that's what happens. I take it home and I start becoming it over weeks. Same thing with Tijuana yeah. Jackson, ex-convict turned motivational speaker, and same thing with Rome. So a lot of times I don't want to know, but the word's gotten out that there's going to be a death, and so I think I should just quit while I'm ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think one other thing I'll say that Rome and Regina are coming into a a, a new space now where I think that, um, you know. Uh, Ro Regina is taking on a new, you know, a new venture. You know, she's, you know, she's trying to get into a, you know, uh, make a, a career move that requires a lot of her time. And so as a result of that, Rome's got to hold himself up a lot more. And that, and that can be incredibly, incredibly challenging. But the surprising thing is, I can't tell you, he has a new, uh, he has a new support system. I just leave it at that. Anyway, I'll, let me shut up. Y'all okay. edit this and just cut out we'll all this it. rambling. Yeah, we'll all take right. it. Thank you. <laughs> all right. No, you're good. So you mentioned that your experiences just in life have been a major influence for you in your acting. But what are some other influences, um, maybe other actors um, who've inspired you or in, um, to be an actor? And then if you could share the screen with anyone, past or present, who would it be? Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. So... <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Thank you for the question, Kiana. I, I, I would have to say, I saw your eyes go like this. I was like, I got that name wrong too? No, I was expecting to say my name. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, <laughs> um, uh, 
Yeah, man. You know, um, I would say that hip hop has been has been a great influence. And the reason is because one thing I learned in acting class, I, when, if you come to California and you don't take Sandy Marshall's acting class, you're doing yourself a disservice. But um, one thing I learned in Sandy Marshall's class is that actors aren't allowed to be in the middle. You have to have a strong opinion no matter what. An actor, the character that you're playing has to be judgmental, meaning the character has to look at a situation, look at the way that a person reacts to something, look at the body language of an individual and have a judgment about it. You cannot be neutral, otherwise you become boring. So that's what hip hop is. Hip hop is all attitude, combative, right? Survival <laughs> mode, yeah. all attitude, all knowing, all observing, because you're looking for the kink in, in the other person's armor so that you can use it against them the minute that person becomes an adversary. And so a lot of it, real talk, was just in the beginning, was just straight up the influence was hip hop. And judgment doesn't have to be a bad thing. Judgment could be like, you know, oh my God, she is gorgeous, but like, but like gorgeous, like we should have nine children gorgeous. Or it could be like, <clears throat> I don't know what school this dude went to, but obviously education wasn't the focus of that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Excuse me. Oh, shit. Excuse my language. I need to clean DJ. Are uh, we going to be able to beep that out? Yeah, beep. Uh, we just beeped it out. There you go. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, that is what came into it. John Leguizamo, not because he he helped put me on, but I've just always been a fan of his. It was ironic that he called me because if you had come to my house back in those days, his his one man shows would be playing on VHS in the background, and I would stop a whole party for you to hear one line yeah. in a John in in in, in his in his in Spicarama or Mamba Mouth. Anyway, um, and then uh, if I were to share the screen with anyone, if I if there was anyone that I could share the screen with, you know, I would say Morgan Freeman. I would say mm -hmm. Robert Downey. I mean, I'm oh, I would say uh, Morgan Freeman. I would say. Uh, Probably um, uh, Robert De Niro, Kevin Klein, Michael Douglas, but I've worked with all of them. Okay. You know, I've I've already done it, so I don't know who I would share. I mean, those those are the greats. I think uh, 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 oh, Viola Davis. Yes. If I could share the screen with anyone, it would be Viola Davis, and not because she's super hot right now. But it's because I love honesty and I love being in the company of people that make me better. And she is, even on, even on social media, she makes me better. I'm conscious about what I post because of her. Cause she just show up and, com and comment on a post or something that I write. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, I gotta be careful what I say. <laughs> I gotta be responsible, you know? Yeah, but it would be Viola Davis if I could share the screen with anyone. Um, and I also would, I know this is, I know this is kind of old school, but I, I I don't think it's that old school. I would love to, I would love to work with people like Robert Downey Jr. and Val Kilmer as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I can are do you, that. You, you they're, they're no, you funny. If you ever watch Kiss This Bang, you'd understand. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. You, you, you got some heavy hitters out there. So uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We got a very, very captive audience today. We got military community uh, tuning in from all over the world. Uh, do you have a, a message that you'd like to share with our nation's heroes today? Ah, uh, Leo, let me tell y'all something. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing what you do. Thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for being strong when you deserve to have the opportunity to weep. Do not be afraid to cry. Take care of yourself because no one else will. And by that, I mean, uh, as we spoke about earlier, if you need help, ask for help. Um, but it, I also mean your diet affects your mood. Your diet affects the quality of your life. Take care of yourself because no one else will. Um, and uh, 
it doesn't mean that you don't have nurturers within your family. I just mean that when you're out there in the field, you know, everyone's dealing with a lot. It is important to prioritize your health. <clears throat> and yes, we are a team, but I'm speaking singular. Um, uh, the other thing I would like to say is that, look, man, you guys are out there earning money. I know some of you have children. Some of you are, you know, a lot of women that are out there as well. And, you know, you're sending money back home. You've got you've got stay at home dads. I met a lot of women out there who were in the military and their and, and their husbands were back taking care of newborns. And, um, you know, I would just say this. You're getting, you know, paid a certain amount of money on the monthly basis, uh, <clears throat> you know, to basically risk your life on behalf of our country and big business and titans of industry. And I think it's important that you acknowledge that and make sure that you look at yourself in the same way. To a degree, <clears throat> you too are a business. And it is important to allocate a portion of whatever the military is paying you to uh, your, your future. And you can do that simply by not being an investment guru or anything like that, but simply taking your money and putting it into an index fund, putting your money into uh, a, a target date fund, which is just basically a, a fund where you put your money uh, in, on a monthly basis, you contribute a certain amount to this fund that you can't access until a target date. That could be October of 2055, but you're young. And I promise you, at my age, I'm 53 years old. At my age, if I start trying to do that now, yeah, I can save up some money, but the real magic of index funds and target date funds is one, you don't have to understand the stock market and a lot of us don't have time to. Two, you don't have to monitor your investments. Over time, history has proven that the stock market will not only recover from crisis, but actually do better. Take your future and yourself serious enough to be able to have something to show for your time in the military other than, a, other than I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say this, but something to show other than scars, emotional, psychological scars and physical scars. I want you to make sure that Yeah, people be calling. I want you to make sure that you take some of your money and you figure out an index fund using Vanguard or Fidelity, maybe even Charles Schwab, so that you are putting aside a portion of your money that you're earning on a monthly basis. And that, because you're so young, the compounded interest is crazy. So by the time you're my age, you balling. You're legit balling. And what's crazy is you will have amassed so much that you won't even have to touch the money because what's go doing is you're, you're now making that money tax deferred. But what's beautiful is, is that when by the time you're ready to draw from it, all you have to do is draw from his interest. You just draw from the interest. So I'll give you a prime example. Uh, at a very modest 7% return on your money, a million dollars will basically give you $70,000 in interest annually that you get to live off of and taxed I don't even know if you get taxed on that. I think there's like very minimal tax on that. As long as you don't tap into the principal, I think that you're getting like tax-free money or you're in a much lower tax bracket between like literally zero and 20%. Whereas your earned income is taxed at a rate of 37% if you're in a high enough tax bracket. So you could be getting taxed anywhere between 20 to 37%. And so the key of this game is not about making money. The key in this game is about keeping money in the right places because the right places help you mitigate the most detrimental expense you have which is taxes and that's the game no one told me that i didn't know it as a result of that i kind of started i didn't it, i wouldn't i was like i made my i bought my first index fund when i was like 30 something years old so that's what i would love to say to y'all is that you know coming out of the military earning money consistently Invest in your future. Take care of you and yours because no one else will. Thank you. That is great advice. You know, we hear a lot of advice like follow your dreams and uh, stay in school and, you know, all that stuff is good. But it's really neat to hear some some strong, real financial advice for, for some of these young people. Um, Dora, earlier, that's what me and Tijuana yes. Jackson do. That's what we do. <laughs> 
<laughs> we love it. We love it. Um, but you know, Thank earlier you. when you heard your 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 voice earlier, I was um, was actually looking and because you're getting a lot of uh, great uh, love on on social media, uh, watching us live. Um, a lot of people are thanking you for your service. They're they're you know saying how great the interview is. We've got some people um, thanking you specifically for mentioning not just the the military but the civilians and the contractors that you you met out while you were you were overseas. So a lot mm. a lot of love for you um, on our social media page right now. Thank you. Mm. My nose is burning yeah. because man, I don't know what it is. I think of those bases and like I'm just ready to just. Ugh. No, I, well, I appreciate the love, y'all, and I really do appreciate you. And I, I think that I've, listen, I, I did not go to combat. Uh, it, 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 uh, it came close because um, I think I was in the military during Kuwait, but they surrendered so quickly that um, we didn't have to go. So I don't quite know what combat is like, but I do empathize, man, and um, I do care about people who are over there having to experience and witness these things. And so I'm glad that you're actually feeling my sincere concern. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I got a couple couple extra comments. I'm looking on my page uh, right now. Okay. Uh, I got I got Ethel Willard Cruz. She said, "I love you in a million little things. Your character focuses. Your character's focus on mental health is spot on." And then. I got Mark Jenkins out there. That's my that's my twin. Uh, <laughs> he said 40 year 40 year old version smart tech scene with Kevin Hart was Oscar worthy. So uh, he, Thank he's, you. he's he's obviously a fan. You know, the Oscars, Oscars missed out on that one. I don't know how they how, how they missed out on that. And he said you play one hell of an MC Hammer as well. So. <laughs> oh, thank you, my bro. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Appreciate that family. <laughs> so what else is on yep, the horizon man. for you? We know that you're still working with Tijuana Jackson. He's always live and in full effect. And he also has a YouTube <laughs> channel. So could you tell us more about Tijuana Jackson and that channel and just the things you're, you have coming at? Uh, well, I, 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 Kiana, bless you for bringing that up. Um, I, I keep it a buck. I have given my life to Tijuana Jackson. I don't care. I'm going to just say it out loud. I, I, I tend to be ashamed to say stuff like this. I have a YouTube channel and I have this character that I created 20 something years ago. I don't know if if y'all are aware of it, but what I was just telling you about index funds and, 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 and investing your money, this is what I do with Tijuana Jackson. You know, I talk about life with Tijuana Jackson and not the watered down, as Dora mentioned, follow your dreams and stay in school. Because <laughs> school, even though school ain't going to teach you a damn thing about an index fund or how to buy a stock and school ain't going to teach you how to assess a property before you buy it. And no, 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 no. We, we go in and I bring and we ask and, and here's the beautiful thing about it is Tijuana Jackson. Basically, if you don't know what this is, he's an ex-convict turned motivational speaker. And what inspired it was is that I grew up around a lot of people who had great intentions, but gave horrible advice. And I love the irony of like someone who was living the most dysfunctional life trying to teach me how to have a functional life. Um, I love the irony of this dude who's incredibly institutionalized via prison trying to teach you how to liberate yourself, how to liberate your, you know, liberate your life. So I took advantage of that, um, be, the ability to be able to see these nuances and created this character as a means of reaching people who wouldn't normally want to hear what a corny brother like me had to say. And it worked. People found TJ funny. They found the stories raw. All I'm doing is telling you craziness from my real life. Yes, I slept on the roof of county jail. I've done that. And all the things that I thought those experiences through Tijuana Jackson are actually real experiences. Um, and so uh, I created this character and over time, the character evolved and the audience was like, yo, <clears throat> we want you to make a movie with this character, man. We need a movie. And sure enough, they're like, if you make if you make the movie, if, 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 if you we'll pay for it if you write the script. And that's what happened. The audience pretty much put up the money. And the next thing you know, I was making the Tijuana Jackson movie that came out. And um, and then from there, the character just started catching on more and more. And so my goal is to take a more entrepreneurial stance with my art and everything that's happening right now on uh, with these decentralized platforms and these different blockchains is really opening up to allowing me to do that. So my goal, as much as I love acting, my goal is to spend the rest of my life doing Tijuana Jackson. And the challenge is figuring out 
how to do because nothing is more fulfilling than the words I get from people who are like, yo, I saw you on uh, 40 year old, on, on, on a million little things and you help. I, I mean, and you help my grandmother understand what I go through. Well, you helped me and my mother come together because now she can empathize with me because she empathized with Rome. And the only other place that I get that is with 40 is with is with um is with Tijuana Jackson. I have people coming to me and telling me you gave me a reason to forgive my father. You helped me understand that I was undiagnosed with ADHD and it was tearing my marriage apart. You helped me realize how unresolved, emotionally unresolved I was. Yo, because of you, my husband and I now own four Airbnbs. That's all I want to hear for the rest of my life is how I help make people's lives better. And that's what Tijuana Jackson does. And it's so fulfilling. So my challenge with it is figuring out how to monetize Tijuana Jackson to the point of not even having to go into work to be an actor. I'm just keeping it a buck. I ain't never said that out in the open, but that's my dream. My dream is to be 65, 75 years old doing Tijuana Jackson and helping people get that real information helping people understand how we are walking through life emotionally unavailable one all the perks of a responsible relationship helping people understand how growing up in dysfunctional environments actually sabotage us in our adulthood because of the fact that we are unable to process the pain that we've endured because we're still looking at it from the perspective of children tormented children psychologically traumatized children we don't know these things somebody's got to talk hey i spent a quarter million dollars in therapy i think i can say something about it at least to my folks you understand and so me growing up in a family of trinidadians and venezuelans and whatnot hey i come from craziness you understand me i know what craziness is i'm the first american born child in my family I know what craziness is. I lived in real hoods and projects. I know what the madness is. I lived in trailer parks. I relate to everybody. And the goal, at least for me, is to use Tijuana Jackson to change the world one step at a time. If you're interested in some real game, it don't cost you nothing. Just go to the Tijuana Jackson channel and just start watching videos. And I promise you, your healing journey will begin. Bam. You, you <laughs> might as well drop that mic you got over there. What? Can you yeah. drop it on the floor or something? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, can't drop this one. Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. So, so Dora, Dora, and Keanu, that just lets us know we, we got to get Tijuana Jackson on the show. We got, we got to book yeah, Tijuana Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> we got to book Tijuana Jackson because we, we got to get some more, some more real life game uh, on another episode. But no, that's awesome, Facts. awesome. Yeah, man. So you, you can told I say us, one thing. No, no, go ahead. When I went on my USO tour and we would go to different bases, everybody was asking me to do Tijuana Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. man, I forgot my teeth. I didn't have my, I didn't have my, got my, I was like, oh man. So I was literally doing Tijuana Jackson as myself. People were in tears. It was one of the most fun parts of the whole tour. I, I thought like, those were different. I thought those were different yeah, teeth. I was, <laughs> I was like, those aren't his teeth. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm gonna give I'll, you a quick. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Okay, let's, I'm gonna let's, a let's check one. out. I'm gonna give you a quick one. Let me see. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait up. Hold What's up. up? Hold What's up, up to you? I can't bro? see. I can't see. I, I need my glasses. I can't see nothing right now. Okay, here we go. All right. That's better. There you go. <laughs> like I was saying, life is like a vending machine. You know, you got to be wise about your snacks. And all y'all folks out there trying to figure out how to get up on this game, okay? You ain't going to get laid by saying certain things. You're going to get laid by saying things a certain way. Bars. Oh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah. That was a special man, I, treat. Oh, that was <laughs> man. We, we appreciate Tijuana Jackson making a cameo appearance on Chief Chat. Appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, well, he's so, a busy since you delete, too. yeah, since you deleted all your apps off of social media, uh, off your phone, uh, can, can, how can our viewers find you if they're looking for you? Um, yo, like I said, you just go to my Tijuana Jackson channel. Um, you know, Tijuana Jackson. You know, not too long ago, uh, these guys, uh. 
when my movie came out, uh, these guys, Gillian Wallow, they um really went in and just, yo, called me all out my name, you know, was got their fans to like downvote my movie and slander my name, talking about I stole Wallow's life story because I guess, you know, Wallow had just gotten out in 2017 and he didn't really know. And he's been he's been prominent in 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 in, in the social media space and he didn't know that Tijuana Jackson had been on YouTube for like you know, more than a decade by that point. And their fans tried to tell him, but they really wasn't, they really wasn't taking the heed. Like they kind of just thought they could just do that and let it slide. So I let it, I let it go for about a year. And then I came back and me and Tijuana Jackson, we just kind of got in them. We, we went hard on them. Okay. So Tijuana Jackson and I do videos together all the time. And, you know, and then Wallow eventually called and, you know, he ended up doing a public apology and we ended up having a really deep conversation about mental health and, you know, and, and just moving forward in a positive way. So it, it it ended up being a great teaching moment, you know, and 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 an opportunity to learn some stuff and um, all of that to make the point that, you know, it's me and TJ on that channel. That's all. And I interview also, I interview a lot of people who can help us in, in if, if you're interested in learning about the off-market real estate game, if you're interested in learning how to like structure your, you know, your, your income so that you're not paying all these taxes, you know, and so it's, and that's the blessing of being me is that, I don't want to sound, I don't want to brag, but you know, I'm a liked dude, you know, for my contributions in the arts. And as a result of that, I can reach out to almost anyone. And I choose to reach out to people who are um, professionals and doing things that can actually help move, you know, us blue collar folks forward in a way that affords us a, a quality life, like, you know, later on down the line. <clears throat> So that's how you find me, Tijuana Jackson. You find me at the Tijuana Jackson YouTube channel. Bars. That's Bars. great. I'm, I'm so, but also, just to remind your fans, they can also watch you on seasons one through four of A Million Little Things on Hulu. And, of course, new episodes on ABC this February. So they can find you absolutely, there, Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I got one other place you can catch me. If you go to the App Store or Google Play and look up Pep Pager Light. That's all you got to do. Look up Pet Pager Light. You can follow me on Pet Pager Light. Every post I do on any social media platform, you will know through Pet Pager Light. Just follow Romney Malco. Follow Tijuana Jackson on there too. We own the app. You know what I'm saying? You oh, might man. as well go and get. I told y'all I'm entrepreneurial. Me and TJ don't play. Sorry, Absolutely. I'll talk y'all to death. Anyway, yeah. Y'all ready no, to get, me, get rid of me yet? <laughs> So we we gonna, we gonna wrap it up. Listen, we can talk to you all day. Trust me, to, to be yeah, honest okay. with you. Uh, but but man, we we know you are a busy man. You and Tijuana, I'm sure y'all got something going on, and and you and you filming. Uh, but I, I do want to plug uh, for our next episode. So um, for our chief chat viewers, the episode this episode will be available on YouTube and Spotify. You can rewatch with your friends and catch up with past episodes and learn more about Romney. Uh, and him and Tijuana Jackson and what they got going on. Also, uh, be sure to join it on January 18th when our guest will be celebrity chef and retired Army Master Sergeant Chef Andre Rush. And then join us on January 27th as we welcome the Emmy Award winning actor Gerald McCraney. So, man, Romney, man, you've been you've been dropping jewels the whole episode, man. And, and we appreciate you. We we covered every topic you can think of from childhood trauma to to financial readiness to military resiliency like all these things and that's the cool thing about my show is uh, people are like why are you interviewing this person but then you when you talk to them we're dealing with the same issues it doesn't matter if you're an actor it doesn't matter if you're a, a, a nascar driver or a writer or whatever the case may be you got you have a military affiliation but some of my guests don't have a military affiliation but uh, when you're talking to human beings, we all we all deal with the same stuff. And so we can help each other by having a good conversation. So uh, this was very fulfilling. We appreciate you. You're funny. You, you know, you, you you gave us some game. We, we had a cameo appearance. Uh, I got Dora and I got Kiana on the show, man. Listen, I, I'm, I'm a blessed brother right now. So I, I appreciate you. You really are, uh, my brother. You really are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a blessed brother. I, I can't. But uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you. I will well, look. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honestly uh, flattered that you would even want to have me on. And I, I'm, I'm, I feel lucky that I was able to actually uh, not only be on, but also get the opportunity to like, you know, be 
with uh, your two your first, two first brand new uh, co-hosts as well. You know, we felt like a special episode, and hopefully, people are able to use this to you know, I don't know, to be inspired to to to, to treat to to look into mental health because um, a lot of us are walking around undiagnosed. You know, uh, uh, when I met my lady, she had two children, a five year old and uh, an eleven year old, and um. Uh, I'm sorry for being so long-winded, but m- her five-year-old is on the spectrum. So we now have a 12-year-old boy who's on the spectrum. And he has helped me understand how many adults are walking around with uh, uh, mental disorders that have never been diagnosed because their families didn't want to acknowledge it or whatever. So it's kind of a responsibility that whether it's a comedic platform or whether it's a very diverse and well-rounded platform such as yours that we make mention of these things because um, it, you, you know, the, the key is to really spread the word. You, you could help people. People might go, let me go get myself tested. Let me go get myself checked out. You know, we have a daughter who just got diagnosed with ADHD, you know, so all these different things are, are important. And she actually figured it out for herself. And then we went to a, a, a health professional. And the reason is because she's in college and she doesn't want to ruin her education. So um, I would just say to anyone who's got an opportunity or gotten an opportunity to be to use your platform, it, it, please, you know, make, make sure to share your stories and your insight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank and so, well, we're, no, absolutely. And, and so this is like I said, we're going to end the live stream. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to edit out anything like it's all live, uncut, raw, which we love it. Uh, but. We're going to end the live stream, but if you don't mind hanging on for a second and we can say our formal goodbyes once we get off the live stream. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, we wish you all the best and Chief Chat out. Hey, man.